Hello, today we are going to be going over the seven segment LED indicator using the PIC 18F 14K50, and we will be using the MP Lab code configurator. So before we did another tutorial where we did not use the MP Lab code configurator, but this time I'm still gonna go over the dynamic drivers, kind of what's going on in the back end, but we are gonna show the different approach that you need to take, or you can take, if you are going to use the MCC instead of doing everything from scratch. Pretty simple, but I seem to struggle describing how the dynamic driver works. So good luck to me, and hopefully this works out. So when you have a seven segment LED, um, all it's doing is it's literally LEDs and individual segments that have a common anode or cathode. I have a common anode in this case, and so I'm going to refer to it as common anode from here on out but it could be a common cathode and you just have to invert your signals. And in this seven segment LED, you have pins, each LED that is connected to something that controls whether or not you want that top pin on, the bottom pin on, right pin on, left pin, middle pin, decimal point, all that sort of stuff. And then you have that common anode that can be connected to uh, generally a GPIO, which will turn the entire display on and off. And for a single seven segment LED, that's totally fine. That's straightforward and don't need to even worry about it. The challenge is, is that uses nine pins. And if you are to, in this case, we have three, if you are to have three of these all hooked together using that same approach of each segment has its own GPIO and the uh, common anode has its own GPIO, those nine pins multiply and you need nine, nine, and nine. So in this case, it would be 27 pins. And that's a lot of pins. That's more than we have on our microcontroller. It would be completely impossible with our current microcontroller and we need a bigger, more complicated microcontroller. However, they have created what are called dynamic indicators, which save a lot of space and are very, very beneficial for smaller microcontrollers such as this one because they're not that much harder to use. They are more complicated to use. There is a certain algorithm that needs to be figured out, but they're not that complicated. Now, the difference is that on a dynamic indicator like this, each segment for each digit for each character is connected to the same GPIO. So if we were to just go through these and say segment A, B, C, D, E, F, G, on each one, segment A of the first digit, segment A of the second digit, and segment A of the third digit are all connected to the same GPIO on the microcontroller. But the common anodes are connected to different GPIOs. So we have digit one, digit two, and digit three, and their common anodes are separated. So even though the segments are connected together and connected to the same GPIO, the common anode is different, and that makes a very big difference. So with the dynamic display, the first thing that we want to do is we want to turn off all of the digits. So we just put a low, uh, low voltage to the common anode of all of the digits, it turns everything off and make sure that we don't have any ghosting or shadows or anything like that. We then apply a low voltage to all the segments that we want to turn on, then turning on the appropriate digit by applying a high voltage for that common anode indicator. So basically we say we want to turn on these segments and if you were to make all of the common anode indicators go high, then the whole thing would show the same thing. But we don't do that. We only show that segment, that character that we want to show. We turn that on, keep it up for a couple of milliseconds, just long enough that our eyes can register it. Then it turns it off. Then you figure out what you want to show on your next character, get all those segments figured out, and then turn on that common anode as well and repeat it all over again, making sure to turn everything off in between so you don't get that weird ghosting. So a static indicator is a lot simpler to control because you just say, here, I want these segments on and we turn it on and you don't worry about it. And with the dynamic, you have to do some timing things and you have to switch between each character and things like that. But even though the dynamic indicator is a little bit more complex in its algorithm, it requires so many less pins and is therefore so much more powerful because space demands are just growing and growing and we want to show more information. And if we wanted to have a 10 character thing and it's nine, then we need 90 pins just to control each one and that would be ridiculous. However, with the dynamic indicator, you only need one additional pin that's connected to the common anode per character that's added on. 
So we have three characters in this case, and this uses 11 pins. And if we were to add a fourth, that would take 12 pins. So as a comparison, let's just go through the numbers. Three digits would take 27 pins if we were to have a static display. But using the dynamic approach, we only have 11 in this case. Again, four would be 36 pins for a four character uh, display versus dynamic approach that we're using here would only take 12. So the dynamic indicators scale way, way better. And that is the appeal for them. Okay, so we've talked about the approach that we'd want to take with this, we'd, about the way we'd want uh, to turn everything on in sequence, turn it on and off. So that means that we are ready to jump into the software. So I'm gonna start screen recording here and we're going to start setting everything up with the uh, the MCC, the my MP Lab Code Configurator, and then I'll copy the code in that Sergey has provided. We'll upload it and see how it works. So the first thing we are going to do is we are going to create a new project, and we are going to make it a standalone project. Keep on going. And this is going to be the advanced. Pick eighteen. F14K50, there we go. And I've got my picket four attached. So I don't need to worry about that. We are going to be using the XC8 for our C code. And we are going to call this one seven segment underscore MCC. Okay. Now up to this point, everything has been very much like normal, but now we are going to make things with using the MCC. So this just takes a, a moment. We can see it thinking, it's thinking, it's okay. But we are just gonna go with the MCC classic. We don't need any of this extra content yet, so we just hit finish. There, that took a little bit longer than I was expecting on that as well, but here we are. So now we have, again, this is obviously wrong because I do not have the QFN. So let's just change that before I forget what I'm supposed to be doing. I have the PDIP and that will get us the appropriate pins. Now, the only real thing that we're going to do here is we are going to assign the appropriate pins as outputs. So basically, if you wanna check out the schematic on circuitbread.com or we will flash it up here and you can pause it for a moment, you can see exactly what pins are connected to what end. So for all of the output pins, you need to mark them as outputs. And they're the ones that are going to be, of course, controlling not only the individual segments, but also those common anodes. So they are RB5 through RB7, and then we have all of RC0 to RC7. So let's just right click on those. I just had some weird zooming issues that I had to resolve, but we are back. So I'll just go and continue making these outputs. And once again, that pin manager help is not being very helpful for some reason, but it'll be what it'll be. Now we will go, we can increase this so I can see it a little bit better. This is where I like to have my external monitor. It's a little bit more straightforward, a little bit easier to see. But I think the biggest thing is let's go over here and change these names. So we have RB5, which is going to control digit three RB6, which is going to control digit two, and RB7, which is going to control digit one. And then we are going to name RC0, which controls the decimal point, RC1, which is going to be segment C, RC2, which is segment G, and I really hope I'm spelling all these correctly or it will not work, segment A, segment D, segment E, segment F, and then the last one will be segment B. Now, because we have the common anode, we will want to start these as high. So we're just gonna go and select all of these. Make sure I get the bottom one. Okay, everything seems to be selected there. 
Okay, and it is also a output, but we don't need them to be analog outputs, so we can clear all of these for the ones that are applicable. And we don't need a weak pull-up because it is an output, not an input. And I think we are good on this page. Since everything is set up, if I did it correctly, all I have to do is go over here and say generate. And then we will have another probably 20 to 30 second. No, I said total time was one second. Let's see what happens. Go over, check out the project that was just made. All right, should be able to see our source files. Now we can open up main. Let's make that bigger. Ah, yes, I should have done this in the first place. All right, so now we have our template that we can use. So basically we have the microchip saying, don't sue us for anything or whatever. And then we have our system initialize and we can put our code in here. So I am going to just copy and paste the code that Sergey has put right in here and it will override all of this. Okay, so now you will see if you did watch the other video and you saw us doing this without the MPLAB code configurator, the first thing you may know is that the code is quite a bit longer. And that's mostly because it's not as compressed. So turning on the different segments and all of that is done in this uh, show digit. That was shown much more succinctly in the other one, but we have the same thing of we are basically saying case zero. So if we want to show a zero, we need to turn on segments A, B, C, D, E, F, G. We don't want to turn on G, we turn it high, which will make it low because in our case, again, we have a common anode. If you have a common cathode version, you are going to need to invert all of these things. And this is something where in the written tutorial, Sergey actually called out specifically, I used a one here, but if you have a common cathode, use a zero here. So he did a very good job of explicitly pointing out the areas where you need to invert it if you have a common cathode dynamic indicator instead of a common anode like we have here. But again, now we have case one where it's just the two segments. So we only have segments B and C set low to turn them on, whereas A, D, E, F, and G are all set high. Now, part of the reason that this is done like this is just because uh, the constraints of the code configurator, everything's a little bit more formalized, and that's totally fine. Uh, Sergey is great at coming up with these little tricks that do amazing things in one line, and that's not the approach with the code configurator. Everything is a little bit more pedantic, like this is this, this is this, this is that, and it's very clear, it's awesome, it's just different. So that is what we have here with this show digit uh, function right there, is it's basically figuring out which cases, what are you turning high and what are you turning low? And then it isn't until we get to line 100, where again, uh, just using the example that he gave of 678, that is the number we are going to display. Now in uh, 101, we set, we, we create an integer digit that will tell us which digit we are currently turning on. And that will be very important here momentarily but we jump into the main um, and here if you did again watch the previous tutorial you will see a lot of similarities so in 106 we have the system initialize and this is instead of having all of that configuration text that we did in, without using the mp lab code configurator this is where that system initialize goes and gets all of those configuration settings that we just did in the gui to turn, basically say, this is an output, this is an input, this is whatever this is, um, this is the crystal frequency, all of those things, that is just done in that single line of 106. Now in 108, we jump into our while one loop. So we are basically going to be doing 108 through 132 forever and ever. Now the first thing we do is, as I mentioned, we need to turn everything off. So we make all of those common anodes low to turn off all the digits so we don't have any ghosting. And that's going to be done every time we loop, just turn everything off. And then we get into that switch function. And so we start with switch digit and it starts with zero where case zero is digit one, case one is digit two and case two is digit three. So in this case, case zero being digit one is showing the hundreds place. So we can go up to 999 and it will run the function show digit in line 116 and what it uses as its parameter is the number that we give it, in this case, 678, divided by 100. 
So 678 divided by 100 is 6.78, or 6 with a remainder of 78. But the microcontroller doesn't care. Since it's not a floating point processor and we don't have it set up for that, 678 divided by 100 is 6. And that's all we care about. And so it is going to show the digit 6. And it sets those segments high to show the digit 6. And then in 117, it turns on that common anode to turn on digit 1. It breaks out of that switch, goes to line 128, and then we have a 5 millisecond delay where, again, it's just putting it up there so we can see that for a little bit of time and long enough for our eyes to register. It then increments our digit, checks if digit's greater than 2, which it's not at this point, and then goes back up to the top, turns everything off to get rid of that ghosting, and then jumps back into that switch where it says, oh, now we're on digit case 1. Now it shows the digit, which, again, 678, and it gets the modulo of 678 divided by 100. So 678 divided by 100 gives you a remainder of 78. So of that 78, now we divide it by 10. 78 divided by 10 is 7.8. Again, no floating point. We just get rid of the point 0.8. It's 7. So we put that in as a parameter for the show digit. And then we turn that digit on, jump out, delay, increment the digit, check, it's still not greater than 2, jump back up, make all of the digits low, we turn them all off uh, in lines 110 through 112 again, jump in, now we're on digit 3 or case 2, and finally we took 678 and modulo of 10. So 678 divided by 10 is 67 with a remainder of 8. Well, we don't care about the 67 because that's all the modulo is doing, is giving you the remainder. And so now we have, as a result, 8. Now show digit says we're going to show 8, Line 125, we turn on digit 3, jump back down to 128, show that for a couple of seconds. Now we've incremented again, so our digit is 3. In 130, we say, ah, digit is finally greater than 2. Let's just reset it. Goes back down to 0, we go up, and we do the whole thing over and over and over and over again. From 108 through 132, just forever and ever. And again, it's very simple, very elegant. I like it a lot. I, I think it's just very straightforward, easy to understand. Uh, but if you do have any questions, please go check out Sergey's written tutorials because he goes through everything in very great detail. So he should be able to answer you there. So let's program this thing and see if I did this right. Okay, and there we have 678 as expected. So that is using the MPLAB code configurator to do the same thing as we did in the other time. I feel like in this case, since it was simpler, again, it was the, the code configurator maybe added more complexity than is necessary, but it's, it's a good practice to get used to it. So hopefully you found this useful. If you have any questions, again, go check out the written tutorial by Sergey. He is so thorough always. He does a fantastic job in all of these PIC uh, microcontroller tutorials have been based off of his works. So just a huge thanks to him and for his continued to support, even with everything that's happening over in his homeland right now. If you did like this video, please give it a like, subscribe to our channel, all that good stuff, and we will continue in the next tutorial. Take care and have a good one. Hey, I hope this tutorial was helpful. Did you know that circuitbread.com also has more useful engineering content? In addition to the tutorials, textbooks, tools, and other things, we have dozens of EE FAQs that explain quick, standalone concepts that are helpful for electrical engineers. Go check them out.